so-called post-era truth, post-truth era, I should say. Now, today we're going to continue to examine some of the case studies. So before we start, I want to quickly run you through the schedule this morning so that you get a sense of what to expect. We're going to have two sessions this morning. And during the first session, we're going to look at three cases. And case number one, visualization of digital news. Case number two, long form and short form video. Case number three is called media app and tech. And after the first session, we're going to have a 20-minute coffee break. After that, we're going to come back with session number two. Session number two is going to be moderated by Mr. Dean Wright, um, the president of Connor Wright Media. Um, the second session will have two case studies. So without further ado, let's get started. Please join me to welcome Mr. Mac Ryla to the stage. He's going to talk to you about visualization of digital news. Welcome, Mr. Ryla. Well, good morning, everyone. You hear me all right? Here we go. Uh, well, firstly, I'd like to uh, say big, big thank you to CGTN for inviting me to talk at this event. I have learned a lot already yesterday, and uh, hopefully I can uh, return the favor, and uh, hopefully I can uh, share a few ideas from my side as well. So uh, I'm based in Sydney, Australia. I think I was the only person yesterday when they asked if there was anyone from Australia. I was the, the only lone uh, person here from Sydney. Now, I, uh, I'm not a journalist, and I don't work for a media company. I, in fact, work for a software company, a software company that creates software to help people analyze data. So in some way, I'm, I'm a bit of a data geek, really. And um, when I think of data, I think of curiosity. And what I mean by that is curiosity, you know, like little kids, when they ask you a million questions and they want to know answers all the time, and you as a parent or an adult, you have to answer those questions. And then something kind of happens when we get older. We, we give up on that curiosity a little bit, right? We, we, we don't ask as many questions. Although I think this room is probably the exception. I think you guys, the journalists, are the ones that keep asking the questions. So you're still little kids like this, really, which is fantastic. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about data journalism. But before we start, uh, the company I work for, we are on the mission, and that mission is to help people see and understand data. And I think this is a very similar mission to the one you guys are on, because you are around to help people see and understand the world. You are there to explain and inform some complex issues to the general public. So I think we've got a lot to learn kind of from each other. So let's talk about data journalism. Now, it is a trend, uh, but it's not a new trend. It's been around for some time. If we go back in history a little bit, you know, back to like early 17th century, before the newspapers were a commonplace, this was the way that people will find out vital information. This is a document or a book called Bills of Mortality from London, where it would list the kind of diseases that people would be dying of in different parts of the city. This was all about life and death. Right? That's how important those data sets were. Later on, a gentleman called William Playfer decided that maybe just putting tables of numbers wasn't really a great way to communicate. Why don't we visualize it in a way that's easy for people that might not even be literate to understand what we're talking about? So he invented a, a line chart over here. He invented line charts and bar charts, uh, in fact, pie charts as well. Um, now, this is a Great example from you know, a few hundred years ago uh, when he compared the balance of trade between Denmark, Norway, and, 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 and England as well. Right? So you would think people would accept this idea thinking this is a fantastic way of communicating information, but that wasn't really the case. There were many naysayers in those days. He's one of them thinking that this is just a little fad. It's going to go away and it's not going to be useful at all. And I saw in the news the other day, there's a guy that thinks the earth is flat, right? And he's trying to prove that to everybody. So, you know, those people always exist. Um, and, you know, and looking at today, 
these charts are exactly the same as the charts we saw a few hundred years ago. So obviously they stood the test of time. But really the question we should also be asking is why do we visualize data? You know, is it just to make it pretty? Is it there to fill out space and make our you know, articles and our digital media a little bit more uh, useful? That's not really the case, or not the way we understand it. The reason I think we visualize data is because that's how our brains are wired up. Right? We are born with all sorts of ways to identify patterns, see shapes and colors, things that we are born with. You know, my son is four years old. He's only learning to read and write. But he could tell you the difference between a monkey and a giraffe and between a square and a circle from a very, very early age. So why don't we lock onto that ability and present information and tell stories so it's easy to understand? And I thought maybe, I don't know if anybody asked the question of the audience, but I'm going to ask the question of the audience as a test. I'm going to give you some numbers on the screen here just to see if everybody's awake. And if I asked you a simple question, like how many times do you see the number three appear in that list? If you know the answer, you can put up your hand. I mean, it could become gamblers in the room, you could be guessing. It's not a hard question, right? Six, nine, ten. Whoever said ten is the right answer, right? Now, I didn't make this easy for you. In fact, this is as hard as it gets. Because your brain, you have to cycle through every digit you have to then count them, and you have to remember how many you counted, and so on. So we didn't use any sort of real brain power that we could use to solve this problem. But if I simplify this for you and make it a little bit more useful, if I did that, suddenly a different part of your brain kicks in looking at those patterns, and you can very quickly see that it's 10. I think it's 10, right? Or another way, doing it that way. So I'm going to show you some more realistic examples now. Uh, since this is such a, a global audience here, I'm going to use some data from Australia, some from the US, from local, from China as well. So here's the first quick little example. Passenger car sales versus SUV sales. This is Australian data set. It looks something like that. Over the last 20 years, the landscape has changed quite a lot. So I'm talking passenger cars, you know, small little efficient cars versus the big four-wheel drives. In 1994, 90% 90 of all the cars sold were passenger cars. Only 10% were the big SUVs. That has changed over time. If you look at this long enough, you can kind of see what's going on here. But wouldn't it be much better if I presented it to you this way? Right? You can, in an instant, without even consciously realizing it, you can see exactly where the trend's going. In fact, I can even tell you what the future holds. If I had a pen over here and I drew these lines on, I could tell you that they're going to meet. And, and they, in fact, met because this is from 2016. So this is the power of visualizing information. Here's another example. Not the most uh, uplifting data set. Fatalities on the roads in America. Uh, millions of rows of data. Again, you could be analyzing this and looking at something in there in a spreadsheet, but it would be really difficult to find some patterns in there. I wanted to show it all on a single screen and see if we can spot some, something interesting. And I did that. So you're looking at all the states in the US, then you're looking at days of the week at the top, and then every little square is an hour of the day. What do you see? Friday night and Saturday night, right? Those are the times where we had most of the accidents. People probably you know, have one too many in the pub and then try and drive home, right? So this is one part of data journalism in some way. That is all about visualizing information, presenting it in a way that is easy to understand. But it still comes down to storytelling. And you guys are masters at telling stories. And we've done this for many generations, or hundreds of years, really. We always use pictures to tell stories, and we still do it to today. But I'm going to show you a quick example. And uh, this, again, being a global audience, football is the game. I'm a big football fan, and uh, specifically in China, there has been a lot of talk in recent years how much money China is spending on football players, bringing foreign football players to play in the local teams. In fact, I looked at this data a little while back. This is from last year, January. And uh, over many, many years, from 2007, where you were in 38th position in terms of how much money you spent on foreign players, all the way to number one in January transfer window in 2016. Right? So with that in mind, I'm going to show you a short little video of two grumpy old men talking about football 
and telling a data story. Uh, so let's play that video. You can use the laser point to show you what we're going to see. So what you'll see is time passing by. It starts, there's the season, you'll see that change from 1901. Yeah. So the total transfer fees of that year, the number of countries involved, and the number of players. The first ever transfer, we think, of players in 1900 were in South America. Right. So this is going to, in one minute, it's going to show you how transfer spending has exploded. I love these things. I love the, you Check see this. online. Check this. Yeah. 75% of all football transfers in history have, start, have finished, have been done in the last 10 years. That's all I'm telling 75%. you. 75%? Of all the football okay. transfers ever done right. in the last 10 years. Right. This is how the business has boomed around the globe. Fire away. Here we're going through it. The early 1900s, occasional transfers in South America and Europe. All right. But the very few people moving at all, because people stayed at one club all their life. But they're a huge one from Asia to Absolutely. Europe. Absolutely. Okay. They're, now they're starting in the 20s. People start to get air travel. Look at the moving fees. Around. The transfer fees ain't going up. Because they're tiny, because it's tiny amounts of money. Now we're getting to the post war period. Numbers okay. of countries involved. Now we're really starting to cook. Into the 50s, John Charles and all that. Russia uh -huh. gets involved. All right. Still it wow. speeds by. Now people are playing football all over the world. Money's coming into the game. All right. Into the 70s, yeah. all over the place. 1.7 now, look at the fees. Now, now look, look at the, the fees, fees going up. All millions right. and millions of into pounds. Into the 80s. Yeah, now, it, now television is starting. Look at, the, look at the money going up. Where's the pointer? <laughs> look at that thing. And here wow, we are, now, recent now, now, heading into where we are now. Incredible amounts of transfers. Oh. Incredible amount of money. Right up to where we are now. Whoa! With 167, 10,000 players transferred around the league. But no, but just the, I mean, nothing. Look at that. It's like a fungus. It's, yeah. it's like Miss Havisham's house. Look at that. Incredible. You want to see it again? Or you... So who would have thought, you know, you could be so excited about data, right? Now, some of you might think, well, was it a gimmick? Or was it really telling a story that if you didn't show it in this visual way, it would be really difficult to say? If I told you there were 10,000 players with, you know, 2 billion... Euros, it just doesn't have the same impact when you see it in life. But the story doesn't end there. We are in China, so we want to take this visualization as it stands. I'm actually interested in knowing how this works in China. So I just select China and engage with that visualization on the website. And I can see those were all the players coming to China over all of time, or I can also look at it going the other way, right? And of course, we all talk about the clicks that we want people to, uh, to click on our website, but it's the engagement, it's people coming back and asking more questions. And in fact, when this was released on different, in different countries, every country had their own story to tell with this. Right? So, data visualization is a language in itself. And someone said it on stage yesterday, that this is a way to get past the fact that things are in English or Spanish or Chinese, right? We can be telling great stories just by using the visual language. And some of you might know Kim Rees, she is the founder of Periscopic, uh, and, and many of you might have seen that award-winning visualization that she created a few years ago around gun violence in the US. I would encourage you to all go and check it out. It's really fascinating. But because it's a language, you can use it in many different ways, the same way as, as any other language. So I'm gonna show you another award-winning visualization that again, some of you might have seen before from uh, Simon uh, Scar from the South China Morning Post a few years ago. And he wrote a story and created this visualization talking about the war in Iraq. Now you can clearly see, even by the title, it is about the loss of life. It is about the, the, the bloody toll. He chose on purpose certain elements in here. He uses bar charts, but in a very unconventional way. He shows them upside down. He uses the red color to illustrate blood, right? And that's part of the article. But what if we change this a little bit? Would this adjust the way the story flows? So if I turn this over and basically adjust it the right way around, so that's the traditional way of showing a bar chart, maybe use a more neutral color as well, and even change the title. And suddenly, there is a very different story in here. It is all about how the number of lost, lives lost has decreased over time as that conflict went on. So this wasn't even me using the same data to tell a different story. This is actually using the same visualization with just few small changes. And you can tell a very simple or very different story. So let's look at a few examples now. Um, 
So all these examples will be on Tableau Public. This is a bit of an experiment that Tableau did a few years ago. We decided to take our technology and just release it to the public in 2010 so anybody can use it for free out on the internet. The only caveat is that it all has to be public. You cannot hide your visualizations. There is no security involved. Whatever you publish there is for everyone. And it was a small little experiment which has turned into a crazy uh, platform now with 300,000 authors, many journalists, maybe some of you are using it already, many students, many governments, many organizations are doing this. With one million visualizations, one billion views, it's a platform, kind of what Yosef was talking about. Everybody wants to uh, be free to tell stories with video. We want everybody to be free to tell stories with data and just publish it there. So here are a few examples from it. See, everybody was uh, having a bit of a talk about Trump, so I thought well, I'll jump on the bandwagon and, and continue with that story. Um, so John, from, who's an economic reporter from uh, the CNBC, wrote a story on, on Trump's complicated holdings of different entities and properties and so on. And you can see over here it says 500 properties, but that doesn't really give me the, the size and the complexity of what's going on there. Uh, I think it'd be much easier to see it if I you know, presented it this way. I can see how intertwined everything is and even give you the ability to go and find out what his aviation empire looks like and his golfing empire and of course I could investigate some of the properties as well. Just a completely different way of viewing and exactly the same information. Here is one closer to home, well home I mean in China today. Um, a lot of talk obviously in China but also overseas around air quality here. So uh, a little while back, uh, Ms. Yang created a visualization and a story when she was at Davos at the Economic Forum there in Switzerland. And she had a whole lot of data uh, of uh, you know, pollution measure, measurements around the four cities in China. Um, now, this was the full visualization which you could sort of interact with, so you can see the, the overview at the top. Uh, but I could maybe focus on Beijing being the biggest city and obviously the biggest one with the biggest problem here. And we can start, you know, maybe looking at some of the outliers. Remember, here's the line, 75 micrograms per cubic meter is, is the safety level there. Uh, many, many days, this is daily data here, uh, many, many days where those numbers are above uh, that threshold. Now, this is all great, but I think there are so many other stories in this data. And it would be really cool if journalists, like scientists, would share information with each other and say, well, you know, you found these stories and they're fantastic, but I want to dig in and maybe find something else. So let's do that together. But before we do that, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, well, how hard is it to make these things? Probably took some developer, probably took some artist and a designer to put it all together. And I know you're not all programmers, right? This is not where you live, your editor of choice, right? You just want to tell stories. So let me see if we can tell some of those stories. So I'm going to take this data set as it exists here, and these were hourly measurements in all the cities over many years. There was more for Beijing than the others. And I had a few questions of my own. I wanted to see if there was a seasonal difference uh, in this data, you know, what is it? Is it January worse than July and so on? So I'm going to start at the point where the other is finished. And let's just play around with this a little bit. So I'm going to change the color so you guys can see this a little bit better. Uh, now, we could be looking at, I'm going to look at Beijing in particular. We could be looking at every single measurement here. And there are many thousands of them. But not just these gaps appearing here. That's, that's a story in itself, right? Saying, well, do we trust this data? Should we be writing a story about it? We need to verify that first. So I want to see this over time. By month, so this is a monthly average. That's sort of interesting, but not really that interesting. I want to break this down by day. So daily average uh, for every month. So five years of data, those are all Januarys, Februarys, and so on. And you can see uh, the orange ones are bad, blue are good. Let's look what the band is between the worst case, the worst measurement, and the average for a particular month. So you can see the winter months are the ones that are standing out. The summer months are down here, right? And we could then go and actually compare this 
to potentially other cities as well. So I'm, I'm thinking, and I'll explain why I think there is a variation like this, and many of you probably know it. If we compare this to Shanghai, the pattern is exactly the same, but obviously many more days where the air seems to be clean. Although that is, you know, the very lenient 75 uh, uh, micrograms. If you take Australian 25 micrograms, the picture changes a little bit as well. So the reason why the winter months are up there is, well, once we're probably producing more pollution because we need to keep ourselves warm, and two, it's cold air. It doesn't move around as much as it does in summer, so it doesn't blow away as easily as that. So let's take another minute and ask a slightly different question. It's like, which time of day should I be you know, concerned more? So let's continue on what we, what we finished off previously. And instead of looking at a monthly data, I'm going to compare this to just hours of the day. So that's my 24-hour clock, midnight to midnight at the bottom. Not a very good news up there, right? All those averages for those days are all above that threshold. I'll just adjust these colors a little bit so you can see it better on the screen. And I don't actually know the answer why this shape is like that, where the late afternoon and night is where the highest pollution seems to happen. Now, that's a question from me to you. So maybe you know the answer why that's going on. And if we compare this to, obviously, all the other cities, some of the patterns look very similar, but obviously at different levels of, of pollution there, right? Now, you guys all uh, work in news, or many of you work in news. It's always good to finish on, on a good note. You know, show a cute puppy at the end of a news bulletin always makes people happy when they finish watching all the doom and gloom throughout the other 25 minutes. So I thought I'd finish on the same thing. Um, and I've got a few questions around looking at every single measurement that we take, that we took, that those were hourly measurements, remember. I'm going to look at them across the four cities. We had more data for Beijing, that's why that first buy is low, uh, higher. And we're going to split this across orange, bad, and blue is good. But I don't want to see it as a percentage of 100, a percentage of total here. So, you know, 46% of the days were, were bad and so on in Beijing. And then I want to break this down over time. And as you can see over here, the, the news is better because all the blue lines are actually going up, meaning that over time, the quality has improved. I know there's a low base we're starting with here, but at least there is some optimism in, in looking at this data. So I just wanted to show you that you know, within, what, three, four, five minutes, we can go and play around and investigate and, and experiment and try new things and find all sorts of new stories that you guys can then tell with data. So just to finish off, um, you know, you guys are all the, the creative, the curious types. You are the critical thinkers here. So I think if you added data and data visualizations to your storytelling, I think you'll be telling a much more compelling stories. With that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ryla. That was truly a riveting presentation. Please stick around while we set the stage for the discussion session. I think what you said is very interesting, is, is relevant to all of us because we now live in a world filled with data. Every aspect of our lives is quantified now, is measured with data, and digging into those numbers could really help us better understand ourselves, better understand the world around us, and also help us do our job better. I think our controller, Madam Liotso, mentioned it yesterday. We already rely very much on big data to make programming decisions. We monitor what story is picking up speed, what story interests our viewer the most, and make decisions accordingly. But you talk about visualization of this digital data. Help understand, please have a seat first. Help understand what does this all mean for, please, what does this all mean for international journalism? What kind of change can it bring about? Uh, well, well, I think one of the key things is that you can, you can give access to this information to a much wider audience, right? Just having tables of numbers, which are difficult to interpret and so on. We could present information in a way that most people, would be able to understand. And I look at journalism as, as an example. If you go back 10 years ago, there were only very simple charts available in newspapers because the data literacy, the data visualization literacy was pretty low. So we couldn't overcomplicate things. You open the newspapers or any of the digital media today, and there are some complicated 
scatter plots and some interesting and complex problems that are being presented in a simple way. So I think getting everyone as much, uh, you know, data literate as possible will expand how many people will understand and follow the stories better. And you can tell much deeper stories too, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to open up the floor for questions and comments. Anyone, if you have a comment or a question, please raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. And before you answer or ask your question, make your comment, please kindly let us know your name and your outlet. Anyone? It could be done either in Chinese or English because we have the simultaneous translation. All right, while you contemplate your thought, let me just ask you one more question. If you look at our industry now, what do you think are the one thing, give it, because in light of what you said, what is the one thing or what are the things that has been constantly overlooked and you think that people in our industry should start paying attention to? Um, so I probably don't spend as much time with journalists as I do with corporates, right? And I can tell you some of the challenges that you're probably facing, and maybe those are the reasons why, um, you know, there, there are a few struggles. Um, so in the corporate world, the corporates tend to collect their own data a lot of the time. They tend to put it in their own databases, and they keep them there, and it's usually in the form that they could use. With journalists, you guys have to find data first, right, which is a challenge in itself. So finding data is, is, is the first challenge. Second challenge is when you find it, do you trust it? How do you clean it up? It's usually quite dirty. You need to make sense of it. And Thirdly, it usually comes in formats that are for humans to read, not for machines to read. You like to put it into tools like Tableau and start analyzing it. Meanwhile, it was designed for a human to read. Right? So some of the, these are some of the challenges, and, and I see very innovative ways that journalists sort of try and, um, and, and, and address a lot of that stuff. So um, I think the other, the other area that I find that maybe journalists struggle a little bit is a lot of that stuff is based on some maths. Uh, and I feel that many have chosen to be journalists because they love words. They write things, they tell stories. Maths wasn't the thing they really enjoyed at school. Maybe they had a bad teacher at school, right? And now it's sort of time to maybe start educating yourself a little bit on some of the basic mathematical and statistical ideas because most of your stories will be more believable and trustworthy if you can substantiate it with some data and especially some visualizations that people can understand. Yeah. And this could generate huge competitive edge yeah. for organizations such yeah. as News Atlas, I suppose. I, I, I might just add another point that, that I find quite interesting. Uh, I mean, there, was, there were a few people talking about this yesterday, that this should be a, a dialogue, right? Uh, so we're not just presenting stuff to, to, to our audience. And I think some of these interactive visualizations allow you to, to, to suck that audience in so they can find their own stories within the bigger story, right? This isn't just a static uh, inf infographic of some sort and it tells just one story. There are many, many other stories in there. So exploring that um, interactive nature uh, is, is another area that I think is going to keep your audience there for longer and probably come back later. Yeah, and do we have any questions now? Yes, yes, please. I'll come back to you in a, in a minute. Okay, thank you. My name is Andy Muhyiddin from Indonesia. I work for uh, online media. Uh, most of our viewers uh, access or watch our video or stories from a smartphone. Uh, and what do you think about, uh, I mean, what is the best way to visualize uh, data from smartphone? Thank you. You mean on, on the smartphone? Yes. Yeah. What is the best way? Oh, that's, that's a pretty tough question. Uh, well, I, I, I think if I may say that, you know, there is a difference between visualizing data on a mobile devices versus visualizing it on a bigger screen. So sometimes I find that people tend to just squash things in and say, well, we're gonna use the same content, and that's great for just text. Because when I go to, I don't know, Sydney Morning Herald back at home, it's the same story on my big screen versus the small screen, right? 
It's the same picture, the same title, the same story. I just have to scroll a little bit more. It's a little bit different with data. And I would compare this to the closest thing I can think of is like weather, weather websites. When I'm on a big screen, I'm actually going in and probably going to interrogate and ask questions and find out if the weather in Bali is going to be nice and warm next week if I'm going there. But when I do it on the phone, the use case is very different. I'm running in out of the house. I just want to know whether I should pick up my umbrella or not. So I feel that if you're going to do it for a mobile device, you need to make it fit that use case, which is a little bit more transient than it would be I'm going to sit back and do more of an exploratory almost analysis on the big screen. Now, as far as technologies go, there are many, many choices out there. Obviously, things like Tableau can work on that, D3 and JavaScript, and I'm sure many organizations here are using those developers to create that. But. All right, the gentleman in the front row. Where are we? Hello, I'm CCTV. 呃，是这样，就是现在是个数据的时代，到处都有数据。呃，要把数据可视化，我觉得应该是三个层次的问题。第一个是数据的获取，就像我们做新闻的人，早期做广播的时候有录音机可以把声音记录下来，现在有摄像机可以把图像记录下来。那现在我们做数据新闻可视化的时候，面临一个问题：我怎么去获取数据？ You are an expert in this regard. So, is there some tool for us to acquire data? For example, the real estate property industry in Beijing, I can get data within a short time. But how do you screen data? Like you mentioned just now, how can I guarantee that the you, I, you can screen out the useful data very quickly? The third level is about visualizing data. You need to have some kind of logic with a simple logic. And can you generate a visualized news? Because news is time sensitive. When you have a clear goal in mind, for example, in the sector of real estate, Mm -hmm. um, he was also asking, the third point I remember was uh, the visualization of data. What was the second point? Again, do you have the yeah, uh, well, second question? The first question is that how can I quickly acquire data for one uh, topic? Uh, the change in the real estate industry in Beijing is there a tool for me to acquire data rapidly? After I acquire the data, I have a lot of data. How do I screen the, the data? Do you have some tools for that? Third, um, if I give you a logic, and can you generate a visualize? The second, the second layer of the question is, when you ha once you have the data, how do you do the data analytics? Yep. So, so getting data, like I say, was probably the number one challenge, right? And as it, the guys from Economist pointed out, it, you know, it's the oil of the 21st century, and by that they mean that it's going to drive everything. So people see a lot of value in it, and more and more they obviously keep it now. They don't share it as much as maybe they used to. I mean, there are a lot of initiatives around the world around open data, and many governments are, are, are putting that and make it available. But like when you're talking about real estate data, for example, that is usually locked up and you have to kind of buy it. Unless you do things that I sometimes do. I'm not a journalist, so I might be, I don't fit under the code of conduct here, but I go scrape websites when I need some data. Uh, that example of the football stuff, that was all scraped from many, many hundreds of pages of data. Now, I wish it was easier. Right? I wish the web was more friendly for us to get the data. Once you get the data, I think that's the easy part from that point on. He wants to know how Tableau does it. How Tableau does it. Well, Tableau doesn't actually get the data itself. I would probably use other uh, ways of getting data, whether it's scripting things like Python and other mechanisms to scrape data, if that's one way to do it. Otherwise, if you have it available, if it's in a database, that's great. If it's in a file, that's great. So all the different formats are acceptable. The analysis is the fun part then, right? Once you have the data and you verify that, look, this is the right data and, and, and do some sanity check on it to see that it is actually going to support your story uh, and you're not just going to you know, create fake news 
<laughs> with that data. So I don't know, hopefully that answers my, your right. question. We're already running out of time, but I believe we have a question from <coughs> the gentleman in the front row, please. First of all, I would like to thank you for giving us a very wonderful speech. My question is about your work. I'm very interested in your work. So while you are working on visualized news, I would like to ask you one question. Do you have the conclusion in mind first after that you do a visualization? Or do you use visualization to come to a conclusion that can light up your eyes? So what comes first and what's your work process? Uh, that, that's an excellent question, right? Um, and I think most of the time I don't have a conclusion. I, I actually look at the data and I just play with it. Right, uh, And there'll be examples where I can create different sheets of data that I'm looking at, and I'll end up with 50 different variations, just looking at it from different angles, and then seeing something interesting in that. So uh, it, it isn't usually like I have a story in mind. I, as I say, I just blog a little bit. I'm not a journalist generally, but I will look at the data and then see if there's something interesting in there. Or another way, I have a question. I don't know what the answer is. And then I go and look in the data to see if I can find the answer. And sometimes the answer is completely wrong to what I expected. And, and that's a good thing too, right? So I, I, don't, I don't usually try to work, work backwards. And one of the journalists I speak to, they, they tend to kind of work the same way. And I don't know if you guys agree as well. Well, thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry we don't have time for now. I'm, I'm very sorry, but we're running out of time. We want to quickly move on to our second case study. Thank you very much, Mr. Mac Ryla. Thank you. Thank you. So let's now welcome um, Miss Lee Dunn. She is the producer at Now This. She will begin our second case study on long form video versus short form video. Please, Miss Lee. Um, can I have the remoter? Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Lee. I'm a producer from Now This Media. And I want to thank CGTN and CCTV Plus for hosting uh, this amazing summit and inviting Now This to participate in. And the topic today is long video versus short video. And I think this topic is perfect for Now This. And for people who are not familiar with Now This, Now This was Seeker, a science and tab brand, Thrillist, the leading lifestyle brand, and the Dodo, number one animal brand on digital media, are four brands on the Group 9 media. And we're Now This. Now This is news for young people. Uh, we bring in more than 2.5 billion video views every month across distribution channels like Facebook, Snapchat, and also Weibo in China. We create news content for the social mobile generation by informing our audiences what's happening and what's important in the world right now. We have the highest social integration rate among millennials news publishers. 75% of our audience is under 35 years old. And 65% of our contents reach to the people who are aged between 12 to 34 years old. And many people call us a short form video company, but we define us as a distributed media. While media landscape changing rapidly, we publishers should involve alongside. You know, we're really focused on the convergence of social, mobile, video, producing both short form and long form of videos uh, that is meant for social feed and optimized for mobile consumption. The social, where audiences live. For us, it's about bringing content to where people live today 
versus trying to produce contents and try to get them back to us. And right now, millennials absolutely live on social media platforms. Mobile, the first screen, increasingly the first screen for content consumers is their phone, is their smartphone. Everybody has their smartphones to consume news feed. And Facebook now has 1.74 billion mobile monthly active users. And that makes for a lot of potential customers watching on mobile. And also though, um, now mobile is dominant platform and video is the dominant content type on mobile. And also the move to video is driven partly by advertiser demand. Digital news media today is in the midst amongst the monetization crisis. Facebook is clearly leaned in and brought video contents to the forefront of the news feed uh, without question and has been uh, open ground where a lot of publishers are seeing a rise in audience engagement around video content. But the platform monopolies like Facebook and Google, whose algorithm changes uh, have forced a significant shifts in strategy for the companies like us that rely on it for traffic. So these changes come at the same time as they've gobbled up almost all of the growth in advertising revenue and begun to engross a substantial amount of the existing advertising revenue as well. So as a media and publishers, we must discover new, meaningful, and integrated ways to reach the audiences and also share the revenue. The traditional media landscape is shifting as control moves to the hands of the audience. The audience now has the ability and the freedom to decide when, how, and where they want to watch it and how much they want to pay for it. Audiences continue to migrate away from traditional TV and consume their content via multiple devices in ad-free environments. So that's why we had so-called uh, burned about moments in early 2015 uh, when we shut down our websites to live purely on platforms. Now, people can still find our websites on the internet, but uh, our website only can lead them into find us in different platforms. And why we did that? Because we truly believe that our audience wasn't there and starting from ground zero to try to build our audiences today, when there's uh, uh, shifting conception pattern happening is looking back forwards. And we believe platforms own distribution and brands own hearts and minds. And as a distributed media, as a publisher, how should we respond? First of all, virality is not a strategy, but it is an end goal. We are not in the business of looking for viral hits. You don't get to 2.5 billion monthly views just because you're chasing down the next viral videos. We're not producing like 30 seconds videos about puppies just being cute. And the idea behind that is we believe a long-lasting brand is built of consistency, um, not trending topics. But how do you achieve the goal without chasing for viral hits? And we got three things, content, insights, and tech. As for the content, content is always the core, like what to cover and how you cover it. For past a couple of years, we've been putting content natively onto Facebook, but in doing so, we've been learning all along the way. And back in the early days, we had high drop-off rates on the first five seconds of video. And 80% was mobile and mainly on Facebook. One of the very obvious things we noticed was that it auto-play, but without sound on. So that was kind of a driver for us of creating videos that was able to allow people to consume a whole piece of content without ever having to go full screen and hear it. So it wasn't just as simple as putting taxes on screen or grab footages online and cut into 45 seconds video. In fact, we take a step back and look at the reality to think about what's the behavior that was seen as native videos started to become more of a calm form factor on the Facebook feed. Now, on social media, 
you share, what represents your viewpoint, what triggers your emotions, like your sadness or anger, and you want to feel smarter and more engaged for what you share. So we cover issues that people, especially millennial, uh, care about enough to watch and share short videos on the topic. We want to be inspirational, educational, and aspirational. We cover issues like marriage equality, gender equality, climate change, uh, criminal justice reform, and which are exactly the kind of themes millennials are passionate about. And here I want to show you two uh, videos that we made, and one is short form and one is mid form. The first one is about one minute. It's about teenagers spend over 700 days in solitary confinement after accused of stealing a backpack. Let's take a look. This is Sarah, short form of video, and in just one minute long. And the next I want to show it's a mid form video. It's about it's above two minutes long. It's about this 102 years old Holocaust survivor re reunited with his long lost nephew, and it's really touching and really triggers your emotion. <laughs> Я бы никогда не, ну даже, ну я не знаю. Никто не думал об этом. Может кто думать так? Вот у меня были родные на Украине, но это с маминой стороны. Вы знаете, что есть большая фамилия здесь в Израиле. Да. Не будете самотны. Я нормально. This is one of the last opportunities that, that we'll have to witness something like this. I feel like we're kind of touching a piece of history. And it's a really uh, touching video that make people want to cry. And both of them performed really well across uh, problems. 
The first one generated 4.5 million views, and the second one is generated 2.5 million views. The first one is about the core issue, about the justice, criminal uh, justice reform. And instead of choosing a long form of videos, we chose to use a short form with good visuals and use numbers to tell the story, to quantify the problems, to let our audience get more sense about what's really happening, what's the problem here. And it will be、um, more memorable for our audiences. And the second one is Really touching, touching, and people want to see the reunited scene, and they want to know the story behind it, and they can see this reunited scenes over and over and over again, and that's why they are more willing to share it. So as you can see, even though as the second video views is not as high as the video,、uh, the first one, but the shares are way more higher. And deciding between short form and the long form of videos has been challenging because both of the forms have value. The short videos、uh, offer more scale and usually with high click throughs and a retention rate, but long form of videos or mid form、uh, videos have higher rate of engagement. And different lens serves different goals. When breaking things happen, we're not putting like five minutes videos to the newsfeed. We are put a 45 second piece of content, and the reason we think people will continue because we're telling them things that are happening right now, and what's happening in the world. So as people are mobile and moving around and spending their day kind of in this quick moment. Where they can learn about what's happening in the world. It's not like we'll say you will understand an issue completely after 45 seconds, but we're constantly putting more news into the feed, so our audience can continuously build and learn. And we are also prepared two to three minutes,、uh, like an explainer or an open letter. For people who want to know more information about the background or more opinions from、uh, everyone else, and our, our videos also deliver、uh, premium guests. Now, this has had exclusive interviews with millennial favorites in America, like former President Obama, from、uh, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, Senator. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and we had just interviewed the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and people are really watching. The Biden video got 30 million views, and one of the Hillary video already cracked one、uh, one million views on day one. Now people are always saying like millennials don't care about politics; they never get involved with politics. But actually, that's not true. I am a millennial. I was born after the 90s, and what Chinese people call the Jolin Ho. And we may not care about certain politicians, but we do care about the political issues that related to us, like、uh, healthcare, like student debt, like climate change. And if you offer me a long articles about politics, I would say boring. But small. Short, informative videos、uh, on social media might be key to creating a politically knowledgeable and hopefully politically engaged millennial audience. And in one of the short, in one of our short interview videos, Obama speaks directly to the camera, exhorting young people to get out and vote. And that video got over、uh, 5.4 million views. And after we in interviewed Hillary, we didn't cut 30 minutes long interview video. Instead, we divided it into like 10 short videos, and each is、um, focused on a certain topics and distributed to our right channels. Like the first one, Hillary、uh, talking about the sexual harassment. He talks. She shares her me at 14 stories. It's a trending hashtag. And the second one, the third one, is about politics. She talked about Donald Trump. She talked about the house care, and we put them onto our now this politics channel. 
And besides those short and mid form of videos, we also have shows like Now This Reports, Now This Nerd, and the App Club's Now This for Facebook Watch and YouTube channels, producing long form original content. And the shows cover core news and political topics like Venezuela crisis and what's life like in post hurricane Puerto Rico. And here I want to show you one of our long form videos called Through Their Eyes, Life of a Millennial in Venezuela. Our producer met this Venezuela student in USA and asked him to show us what's life really like there underground through his eyes to uh, engage, to get our young millennial audiences involved with, our, uh, with this topic. In case you were wondering, this is currently the life of a millennial in Venezuela. And this is just a short version of it. The original one is about 12 This well. is Gianpaolo. He's a 22-year-old Venezuelan. I met him in New York the day he graduated from college. He was returning home to Caracas for one month, and I asked him if I could join him. Virtually. We were walking, protesting to the National Election Congress until the repression started, police shooting tear gas against us, um, actual shots, marble, metal marbles, violence, as I was saying, has exponentially grown every day since I've been here. Your parents are worried because you're, you're basically risking your life for something, but you have to, do, it's like a duty, it's like you have it, you know? I lived here for 18 years and I, I'm not throwing it away just because a small group of guys are trying to take my country away and there's no shot. We are at Farmatodo, which is one of the biggest pharmacy chains here in Caracas, and I just came here to see if we could get some medicines for the house. No, no, I believe enterofermina. Any antibiotic for any infection you have, those we, we couldn't find it at the pharmacy. And this video has got 8.7 million views and over 6,000 shares across channels on Facebook. Now, our audiences are really engaging to comment it and share it. We also translate this piece of content into Espanol and Mandarin. And when we think about, like, the crisis in Venezuela happened, how can we cover these issues to our audiences? And when we met him, we think it's a perfect uh, opportunity because he's a millennial and he's from Venezuela, he can tell us the story that other media can't tell. So, and compared with the previous short videos, this kind of long form videos can help us build brand affinity, which require true viewer attention. And speaking of the insights, uh, our every content makers work very closely with our insights team they will get feedback from our insights team. I will not say we're a like, data-driven uh, company, but we're definitely data conscious. And the data, it just half the story. We are not simply bringing raw data to content makers. It's about interpreting it and turning it into new ideas and insights. We spend a lot of time looking at how our video performs the drop of rates, the completion rate, the retention rate, and try to understand what makes a good piece of content for the feed. They're also looking at what's not performing in order to raise the floor. We consciously don't focus on viral hits. In fact, we tend to throw out the top 10% uh, performing videos and the bottom 10% performing videos and focus in, ana in analysis in favor of focusing on the median to understand why, and they give feedback to our producer to help them make improvements, no matter is the, about the topics they choose, or the lens they choose, or the formats they choose. And like I said, we, we don't have our websites, so we, so we built a CMS-like platform called Switchboard that has workflow functionality like storing video assets and data science capability that gets real-time analytics and push directly to the platforms uh, using APIs. And it really can helping us uh, work better, faster, and smarter. 
And it's those three factors that made us get to 0.5 billion monthly views instead of chasing down for the viral hits. And second, our, uh, we distribute our videos to different platforms like Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram, but mostly on Facebook and Snapchat. And best lens for each platform is quite different. You look the way the Snapchat discover in terms of the products, in terms of the products experience. Uh, there, there are 10 second snaps broken up three to four uh, snaps with an ad. It's really different. It's not the. It's really different behavior. It's not the feed. So here is our video contents on Facebook and on Snapchat. They're really different. On Snapchat, you can see we trimmed our video contents into 10 seconds on Snapchat, and it's still very visual. We still put our taxes on screen, and it's still now this style. But we've been thinking from the editorial standpoint, um, and how do we bring content that works well with product experience, and that's very different from Facebook. Now, obviously, Snapchat is not the platform for long-form uh, contents. And here is another example. It's about the Hillary uh, Clinton videos. And we also, uh, within each platform, we launched the nine channels to feed different interests. We got now this is our main page, now vote about politics, now future, now her is a female oriented, oriented channel, now pop about entertainment, and also now money, now sports, now weed is about weed legalization in America. And we also adjust the lunch and now food. And the reason we did that, the first of all, we need a place to put our contents. Now, Facebook particularly, if you put out too much content, there was a point in terms of value had a diminishing return. So you only had a certain amount of posts you can make a day. And we need to find a way to leverage our audience brands to build our audience on Facebook. But every time we launch a new channel, it's done with the thought, it's done with the data. Three criteria must be met before the publisher launches a new channel. The first one is a topic in the main feed regularly get above average engagement with our audience. And now this has enough content to populate a new page, and it could carve out a distinct point of view. And that meant female-focused channel, now this her, is about doing stories about inspiring women instead of like another uh, fashion and the beauty uh, channels on Facebook. And now this food centers on cultural stories about a food desert and waste instead of recipes and food porn that Facebook already has tons of it. As more people get into video and more people to trap to try to replicate the success we have had. We think it's really important to build brands. And for building our brand, I think the same rules apply. We are continuing the focus is on the convergence of social, mobile, video, are producing short form of video content about the core issues that matter to our young audience with the insights and data. And we'll still keep our distributed model to uh, distribute our video contents to different platforms to fit different interests. But with the huge audience base we have, we think now is a really good time, a really uh, good opportunity for us to extend and amplify the now this brand by going deeper into longer form of programming around the key issues and the topics that do well in the social feed. So we were about to do short, mid, and long form of videos. Uh, and a big reason the longer video worked is that the brand was seamlessly integrated into the video. Advertisers are competed with high quality content that is um, available on demand. 
And regardless of video lens, some views will drop off very quickly. But that perfect five or three minutes long form of videos offers storytelling and engagement opportunities, often with your most interested and valuable cus consumers. And Facebook is now prioritizing longer videos within its newsfeed. They launched the Facebook Watch that features original video shows recently, and it's really a happy coincidence. It will be an environment where shorter social video performs better in the news feed, and the longer form content works in other areas of the platforms, and it's aligned to our strategy. And whether short or long, authentic stories captivated the people. You can tell a story in 30 seconds or in three minutes, and people will watch both as long as the video is good. I still believe that it's all about building a brand, the platform's own distribution, and the brand's own hearts and minds. It's not just uh, the format. And now, as a video, as a company producing video, I'd like to show the last video about now this. Nothing else matters. It's the connection. You got it. Stay woke. Stay energized. Stay on point. Understand what's going around you. Let's just stand up and make those demands. Nobody hears it. Please calm down. I grew up along these existing barriers, known to us as a wall. This is a gathering about our voice and our right to use it. Our glorious diversity. We are here. Our diversity is of faiths and colors and creeds. We are here. We are here. That is not a threat to who we are. It makes us who we are. You have a voice. And you have a right to be exactly who you are. We are here. We just got to get out there and do it. right here on Now This. I've never interviewed someone before. <laughs> now you tell me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Please stick around. We have a Q&A session. Please. Okay. Yeah. Long form video, short form video. I think this is uh, something that has been constantly under discussion um, for a lot of marketers, content providers. They're trying to decide constantly, right, whether to use long form video or short form video because, like you said, both have values. Um, so let's see if we have any questions from our audience because the time we'll, we're going to take. Yeah, the gentleman on the second row, please. Thank you, Yusuf Omar from Hashtag Our Stories. You spoke about this fragmentation. You've got now her, now this, numerous brands. How do you manage to maintain so many different entities in the most uh, resourceful way? Uh, I'm sorry, in most of what way? In the most resourceful way. How do you, if you've got limited resources, how do you manage to maintain all of these separate accounts, all of these separate platforms, all these separate brands? Uh, like I said, there's uh, three characters, uh, characters must be mad when we launch the new verticals. And we, like our, our main feed, we have to get higher, the certain topics we have get higher uh, engagement with our audiences. Like about the female rights, the gender inequality, there are certain topics that also get higher engagement. And that's help us. If we launch it now, this her, we can sure that we can get our audiences, and get their views, and get an engagement, things. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, can you um, explain whether all of the films are made by your in-house producers, or do you accept UGC? And can you also explain the business model behind this? How, how do you monetize what you're doing? 
the monetization is always the hard problems for the digital media today. And we have uh, studios and produce branded content. Uh, it will not usually see on your Facebook new, uh, feed. But uh, yeah, we got the branded content and also working with uh, Facebook. And the Facebook will pay us for the original videos, for the certain amount of original videos. Yeah. And UGC? Uh, we don't have UGC, yeah. Ms. Zhang, please. I have two sort of short questions. One, you said you have no uh, your own website, or but I see that knowledge have your own app, right? Uh, we don't have. We shut down our website. You sh do shut down already. Shut down our website. So I, I checked that like uh, five years ago. You have your yeah. Own, you shut down that because yeah. of the uh, cost. Or it's not just about cost because we believe that our audiences want, wasn't on websites. They all live on the social platform, media platforms. So instead of like producing content and try to get them back to us, we just go into where they live. Very yeah. interesting. And second question, uh, you mentioned about all your revenue comes from Facebook. And it's, you split it. Uh, how, how large is your original content production team? Uh, our team is, uh, the newsroom is more than 100 people right now. It's, well, how, it's how many uh, monthly, how many original videos you create? Uh, it depends about the topics we have, but mostly, like if we produce 65 pieces of content, and about 40, 40 pieces of content is original. So 40 pieces average monthly, right? Uh, yeah, okay, uh, every day. So is that well pay for the cost of your products that the money you earn from Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Facebook is our largest partner right now. And the monopolies like Facebook and Google almost uh, clearly gobbled up all of the advertising revenue right now. And we try to cooperate with them and try to share the revenue. And because Facebook like Facebook and also like Amazon, Netflix, they want original contents. They want contents with high, good quality. And that's what we can offer to them. And yeah, hope so we can make some money. <laughs> the gentleman in the back. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. I come from uh, Sichuan Radio and Television Group. Uh, so I'm in the traditional media part. But I'm really interested in to ask you a question. You know the uh, Kuaishou, right? Yeah. They quickly had, right? Yeah. So what's your thinking of the uh, Kuaishou? Uh, because they now have like 0 0.6 uh, billion users. Uh, they increase that number in a very short time. So what's, uh, do you have any comments about Kuaishou? I think quite show, and now this is really different. Quite show is I like know a, you are, it's different between your company, yeah. right? Totally uh, different uh, targeted uh, audience and uh, targeted marketing strategy. But uh, any comments about quickly heads? Uh, quite show. I think like we're producing different kind of videos, right? And they are UGC platform. The people is the key. They want to gather enough people to, up to, like, to upload their videos on Show, And that's really different from uh, what we do because we're a news company. Yeah. Yeah, because after seeing your presentation, I get the sense that your company wants to build long-term brand affinity. And you said yourself, virality is not your strategy. Um, but long-form video appears, you know, studies show that they do well when you want to engage your viewers better, when you want to build that long-term affinity. But you also consciously choose to do short videos in some cases. So I'm just curious, what kind of factors do you take into consideration when you are trying to decide which form of video to use? And we are a news company, right? And if, like when breaking things happened or just uh, the, the, the things happening in our daily lives, we produce short videos to our audience. The, the key is about, uh, is tell them what's happening right now. 
But we still learn from a video. We want a higher engagement. We want to do uh, problems like deep issues. You want to talk to them deeply. Yeah, and to get them engaged with us. And that's something like the short videos cannot do. And there are many like the short videos, like that 102 year old uh, Holocaust survivor video. Actually, that's all over the Facebook. It's not just now this video, it's also like the Vice video, Mashable videos. It's not ours. But the long videos can be ours and ours only. Yeah, and yeah. you really show to our audience that stories that can yield emotional engagement. Um, could do well. Thank you very much, Thank Ms. Lee Dunn. Thank you. Thank you. I want to move to our uh, third case study now. So please join me to welcome Mr. Song Xiaomin. Um, he is going to talk about technology innovation for us. Um, please. I'm very glad to attend this uh, global media forum and the VMF uh, forum. I'm honored to be here to discuss uh, the topic on media, app, and tech, which is a uh, topic that you are interested in. Maybe you do not know much about the Sorbet. Let me briefly introduce Sorbet. Sorbet is dedicated to the media application and the technological innovation. We focus on content production, management, delivery, and operation. In China, uh, we have the main business, business. As we know, media convergence and the cloud computing have uh, been developing very rapidly in China in terms of uh, content production and the technology platforms, how to integrate them. A lot of uh, reflections have been done on the global scale. There have also been a lot of uh, practices and uh, innovations. We hope we can absorb the reflections both in China and the rest of the world to cope with our challenges. We hope we will embrace a future together with you. Today, relying on video alone cannot well meet the needs for applications and technological innovation. So we may to ABC technology. process of innovation, the domestic market has focused on the cloud framework under which a comprehensive support is provided for the content production and delivery for private cloud public cloud, they have support the elasticity of the resources, but this is not enough. We need to be oriented to the applications and mobile-first strategy. So, 
how can we, based on the elasticity of the cloud, to provide a platform that can meet the needs of the customers. This is something we are most concerned with. We have introduced Cloud Aritium. As a software support for mobile first applications and concerted or coordinated applications. In China and also on the global scale, a lot of uh, experiments have been done in cloud computing. In the future, big data, artificial intelligence will provide a strong support for big data and also for the applications in different scenarios. We need to discover valuable scenarios and to work out more applications. We have also done some explorations in this regard. We have talked a lot about data. For the future, increasing, increasingly, we need to find out the relationship between the data and also the relationship between the data and the users and the relationship between the data and applications. We need stronger support to address such needs in terms of uh, data visualization. We have done a lot. Uh, we uh, uh, examined different topics and the public opinions. We are trying to create a closed loop to select the valuable data. We are also keenly aware that visual visualization of data is not enough. So we want to have some innovation in terms of a data convergence. We have accumulated so much data. So how can we do data mining in order to provide better efficiency and effectiveness? So we have uh, considered smart labeling. We do a lot of online shopping. This is a very pleasant experience. And the shopping platform is supported by a huge amount of data to optimize the shopping experience. So we can follow the same model to support the content labeling, categorization. We also hope that through voice recognition or image recognition, we can search for the right content. This is something we are very much interested in. We hope, we also want to venture deeper in this regard. For us, we look at the different kinds of uh, programs, such as uh, sport programs. We also tried our some options. For instance, the players and the football teams and variety shows. We also examined the relationship between different uh, relationships. Now we are considering the applications that are adapted to a faster changing world.
So we have uh, developed this kind of a process. When we browse short videos, when we view different scenarios on a daily basis, how can we achieve a better effect on our platform? We have also developed some small tools that can be applied in the cloud environment. We have also tried out the fragmentation of a long form videos which can be readily available for use without further processing after fragmentation. Uh, initially, we felt that we need to have further processing, but with the technology support, the fragmentation process is fine, and the fragmented materials can satisfy uh, different application scenarios. Yesterday, we also discussed the serious news. We also consider such serious uh, content. Uh, for instance, uh, we use the smart technology uh, to search for the serious uh, news for celebrities and for uh, specific targets. I think such applications will become more and more with the support of uh, the latest technology. We also have NLP, Natural Language Processing. Journalists hope to publish their content efficiently. So with the technology, technological support, we can extract out key information such as the dates and uh, key figures, and this can enable the writing process to be more efficient. We are now witnessing the convergence of technology. We also introduce the APC cap capacity to meet the needs in the journalism. Okay, so uh, this is uh, what I like, what I would like to share with you today. Uh, Xie familiar with the Sobe system. I mean, we use it every day at our work. This is the editing software in our newsroom. Thank you. And this is, again, a perfect example of media and technology converging into one, changing the world as we know it. Do we have any questions? We're, open, uh, we're opening the floor for questions and comments. All right, I'll start. So, Mr. So, you mentioned about AI um, in your presentation. I was just wondering, because AI is now making its way to every corner of our lives. Um, we already have AI news writers, news writing robots. Do you see it as something that could become mainstream sometime soon? Okay, okay. Can we have the translation set? Uh, I just... But... Okay, uh, uh, she's now translating the question. Do you feel that AI for the news media, this will become mainstream very quickly because we already have new AI news writer robots writing news. They can write a comprehensive piece of news in a few seconds. Now, AI technologies in the past 10 years, it was not a focus or priority, but in 
recent times, AI has become a focus of attention. There are reasons for that. Now that we have upgraded cloud computing and we care more about the value of content and the data or user data. We accumulated a lot of data. Now that we have uh, in-depth uh, neural uh, network technologies updates. If we just use some simple algorithms, we can fulfill all of the requirements. Now that we have data, data combined with intelligence, I believe that this can provide us greater support. So in this phase, we think that starting from now, in terms of data and intelligence, we can make a more attempt and exploration. In the coming two to three years, I believe that um, in the new sector, AI can play a greater role. I think that's a wrap for case study number three. Let's have a 15 minutes coffee break and let's come back at 11, 11, 11, 15, 11, 05. Yeah, let's come back at 11, 05. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh. See the difference. In this fast-changing information age, news and news media are evolving quickly. Truthful or neutral, inclusive or polarized, the debate never ends. CGTN brings together the world's top media leaders and experts to Sanya to discuss a shared future. Join us for two days of discussions and insights at the CGTN Global Media Summit and see the difference. In this fast-changing information age, news and news media are evolving quickly. Truthful or neutral, inclusive or polarized, the debate never ends. CGTN brings together the world's top media leaders and experts to Sanya to discuss a shared future. Join us for two days of discussions and insights at the CGTN Global Media Summit and see the difference. In this fast-changing information age, Hi there, you're watching CGTN live streaming. I'm He Weiwei in Hainan province. And today, CGTN is holding a global media forum right behind the meeting hall behind me. And this is a two-day summit, uh, which opens yesterday, when the CGTN controller, Zhang Heping, delivered a keynote speech talking about the upgrade of new mainstream media. And today is the second day of the foreign schedule. And just now, three guests from different video provider and also um, some other companies share their experiences. And they talked about the visualization of digital news and long form videos versus short form video and also some media apps with technology with technological innovation and and now is the tea break time so as you can see Hainan is a very nice weather here so the guests are here enjoying the sunshine and also they uh, talk to each other to share their point of view of this foreign and some issues related to media and TV industry. Let's go inside this meeting hall to have a look. So this is the venue 
where the forum has been held. And this time, CGTN invited over 100 media organizations from 45 countries to gather together in Hainan province to discuss the opportunities and challenges that we, the media people, face. And now you see as the uh, screen. I want to introduce this screen a little bit more. And as you can see, this is probably the longest screen that you have ever seen. At, at, at least this for me. This screen is 30 meters long and 4 meters high. And yesterday our CGTN controller Zhang Heping just delivered a keynote speech here. He talked about, let me quote his words, some say that in this new era the content is king. While some others and uh, champion technological uh, innovation or accessibility. But our controller Zhang Heping said, in this new era, the integration is the king. So let me give you a brief introduction of our CGTN. CGTN was launched on December the 31st, 2016, which is the very last day of 2016. And now we have over, I can't remember the figures, let me tell you. Um, we have over 380 million audience from over 117 countries. And also we have a total number of 87 million followers on our uh, uh, social media platforms and our Facebook we have 52 million subscribers or followers that tops worldwide in terms of the uh, number of followers in the global news media and in 2017 CGTN was awarded as Facebook's outstanding news media page that's quite encouraging for us because we are still a young media organization and we have been launched for less than one year but um, actually CGTN is affiliated to CCTV China Central Television which is the uh, state China state television and CCTV rebrand its international uh, networks by launching our CGTN and CGTN we have six different channels the English channel is the flagship one and also we have news broadcasting for 24 hours in four other different uh, languages that is Russian French Spanish and Arabic so this four language including English including Chinese are the six working languages of the United Nations so China uh, China is um, providing this uh, 24 hours non-stopping news broadcasts in the six uh, language and aiming to um, provide a more inclusive perspective of China to tell the global audience that what China is look like and hopefully you are one of our fans and let's go outside to see if we can talk to anyone In October, our CGTN just launched a news center. It's an integrated platform that combines not only the TV channel, not only the TV channel, but also uh, some uh, uh, social media platforms. And we're aiming to provide, to break the barriers between the traditional TV and also the social media we want to put them together and that is our topic today the media converges so let's see if we can just talk any of this on on leaders hello sir hi hi you're just back from me thank you you're just coming back from the tea break yes. I am a CGTN reporter we're yes. doing a live streaming report yes uh, would you like uh, can you tell us um, Introduce yourself a little bit, you and your company. Yes, uh, I am Spokson Silapet. I am a journalist and a news anchor for English News for the Lao National Television. So you're from Laos? Yes, I am. Welcome. Mm -hmm. And today you have entered our uh, uh, 
uh, attend our meeting and yesterday you yep. have listened to the keynote speeches. Yes. So, and in terms of us, our CGTN, mm. our aim is to mm. tell the stories of yep. China. Mm -hmm. And as a media counterpart from Laos, mm -hmm. I'm quite interested that mm. what kind of Chinese news what kind of the Chinese news are the uh, Laos audience are most interested in? What kind of news they want to know about China? Well, first of all, uh, with as you may have already know, uh, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Laos just recently, less last year, and of course, it, like two weeks ago. Sorry, two weeks ago, and as you as you as you noticed that it raised a lot of uh, not just questions but also a lot of interest about China. And of course, uh, Chinese people or Chinese business investment is is reach uh, uh, number one in in Laos in as foreign direct investment. Of course, like Lao people is always wanted to know about China, in particular about uh, especially other regions of China, not just. Uh, and of course, because there's some parts in China, for example, in Yunnan, Kunming, they we share a similar culture, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, and of course, what we also want to let you know is most Lao people like to also know about is. Um, what is uh, China's plan for development, especially in Asia, in Southeast, in particular in Laos? As you may or may already know, uh, China, the China has also invested with the Lao government uh, a railway project, which will be connecting uh, Yunnan to uh, our capital, Vientiane. Mm -hmm. Which, in maybe around five years, we will be able to be able to uh, ride the train mm -hmm. directly from China to Laos. So it's an interesting time for us. Uh, for for uh, Lao China, uh, not just the dialogue partnership, but also in in cooperation, in media cooperation as well. Mm -hmm. Because you know, me being here is also is a, not uh, not just a good opportunity for us to meet many other people, but also to enlighten and enlighten on many different topics, especially uh, revolving around journalism mm -hmm. and what we can do for the future. And in terms of journalism cooperation, you are a journalist yeah. and anchor from Laos. Have you ever? Um, have a chance to visit China and do some reports in China? Well, this is my second visit to China, but uh, as uh, to participate in the conference, my first visit was as a student. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm quite interested about China. I'm um, very, as, as a growing up, I'm very interested in about Chinese culture. Uh, uh, and also, like, I'm very interested in what, um, what China, more normal Chinese people, uh, view other countries, especially Lao people, and what 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 the normal Chinese people think about, mm -hmm. and what are their interests about Lao people? Those are some of the things that uh, I'm most interested in doing in the future. Yeah, that is our mission too. Our mission is to is to um, boost the uh, mutual understanding of yeah. people from different countries. Yeah. And today our topic is about the media convergence. Mm -hmm. And you know, recently I have to say that our TV industry mm -hmm. have a lot of challenges. Yes. And is that the same to your company? And to Lao? Well, uh, in Laos, uh, we've, um, our traditional media has always faced many challenges, but at the end of the day, uh, for the local Lao people, the Lao citizens, we, they still rely heavily on traditional media, whether it be television or radio or print media. Uh, in the future, at currently, like, you know, we plan for the future, we also involve in uh, social media development as well in our, in, in our uh, uh, reporting. Uh, now we have a uh, YouTube channel where you know we posted practically almost every program that we have mm -hmm. in all of our six languages you know traditional Lao, French, English, uh, Vietnamese language and um, mm -hmm. uh, the are two ethnic ma major ethnic languages as well so uh, we we're quite confident that uh, with the use of the new, new media like online media that we're definitely we will try our best to promote it more and get our stories, get our content out to the people, not just in Laos, but around the world. Okay, and China is now, you know, looking forward to more, more international cooperative, especially in our media yes. sector. And thank you, thank you again, thank you very sir, much. from you. Lao National Television. Thank you thank again you. for coming. Thank and you. this CGTN Global Media Forum mm -hmm. is, will be an annual event. And yes. hopefully next year we'll invite you here. Hopefully. Yes. <laughs> we you. have seen more cooperation. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. And for new newcomers, just to remind you that you're watching CGTN live streaming reports of a global media summit in Hainan province. And I will come back in a short break. Let's stay tuned. Thanks. 
CGTN brings together the world's top media leaders and experts to Sanya to discuss a shared future. Join us for two days of discussions and insights at the CGTN Global Media Summit and see the difference. In this fast-changing information age, news and news media are evolving quickly. Truthful or neutral, inclusive or polarized, the debate never ends. CGTN brings together the world's top media leaders and experts to Sanya to discuss a shared future. Join us for two days of discussions and insights at the CGTN Global Media Summit and see the difference. CGTN China Global Television Network is a multi-language and multi-platform media grouping. You are watching CGTN. Its six principal oh, TV channels are CGTN English, Spanish, French, Arabic, Russian, and CGTN Documentary, China's first state-level English documentary channel. It also includes CGTN Digital and CCTV Plus, which delivers visual news footage to other media organizations worldwide. As the nucleus of the new organization, CGTN English provides live news and current affairs programming 24 hours a day. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, D.C., and Nairobi. You're watching CGTN. You're watching CGTN. You're watching CGTN. I'm Jeff Moody, live in Beijing. CGTN is utilizing media convergence to carry out its mission. The strategy calls for using television as the driving force to power and expand mobile and digital presence. Its media convergence center combines multi-format news gathering and multi-platform resource sharing as well as multiple channel and distribution outlets. CGTN is also making strides and broadening its reach through advancements in social media, video streaming, live programming, and mobile access. We're watching the link. CGTN boasts an extensive global reporting team with correspondents throughout China and around the world. With its official model of See the Difference, CGTN is committed to reporting global news from a Chinese perspective and telling China's stories for a global audience. CGTN. See the Difference. On January 1st, CGTN, China Global Television Network, officially took over from CCTV News. Hello and welcome to Global Watch. Our mission, to link China and the rest of the world. Telling China stories that no one else can. Telling stories that are often underreported. Even if I and covering events in a way to make a difference in a new age for discourse. News and features, business and sports, culture and entertainment. China has been able to With commentary from a Chinese perspective, CGTN offers a strong alternative in global communications. CGTN, see the difference. On January 1st, CGTN, China Global Television Network, officially took over from CCTV News. Hello and welcome to Global Watch. Our mission, to link China and the rest of the world. Hi there, you're watching CGTN live streaming. I'm He Weiwei in Hainan province. We are here to hold a global media summit and here I have found Yusuf Omar and is my hey, special hey. guest today. Omar, introduce yourself to our What's audience. What's up guys, my name is Yusuf Omar, I'm the co-founder of Hashtag Our Stories. We train communities how to shoot, 
edit and produce stories using mobile phones, just like how this is being produced on a mobile phone right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I see you're wearing a very special pair yeah. of glasses. Tell me more about So them. these are called wearables. They're, they're called Snapchat spectacles. And if I press uh -huh. this button and I come in... Can you press you this button. Yeah, you see the light light. is on. Yeah. I'm recording you right now. You're recording right yeah. now. So, and that comes through straight to my mobile phone uh -huh. and it streams across and then I can watch it on my phone. Uh -huh. It is a real, and a really amazing thing is it takes a round video. Uh -huh. So I can watch it okay. sideways or yes. upright. So man, how you roll this, uh, yeah. your mobile phone. Because the big debate in media is do we go vertical, do we go landscape, yeah. how do we package our media? Uh -huh. Right now we're landscape. Yeah. But if I was producing on a mobile, I'd be vertical. But if we go circular, you can do both. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I, I like it. I, when I'm walking through China and I'm checking out things, I don't have to do this. I can just look at the world. That's and when fantastic. I'm doing interviews, I can also Where's interact. Where's the bodies? I want one. <laughs> <laughs> you get them online. I don't work for them, but uh, okay. yeah, you can get them online. Can, can this be live streaming too? No, it only records 20 second videos and then uh -huh. you can decide to put them up later. Okay, so you have been working as a journalist and previously for CNN and now you're providing, uh, you know, uh, news production yep. online. So tell me your experience of this video, video news reporting. Uh -huh. It is the most exciting space to be in right now. Everybody is making this pivot to video. At the moment, 50% of the internet is made up of video traffic. Mm -hmm. By 2020, we estimate that 75% of the internet is going to be video. Mm -hmm. So if you are not in the video space, and if you're not innovating the digital video space, you're dead, you're irre irrelevant. Mm -hmm. More specifically, I think what's coming out of this discussion is what kinds of formats we do. Are we doing long form? Are we doing short form? Are we doing viral videos? There's so much nuance. I mean, just to say you do video is not enough. We need to be quite specific about what our video strategy is going to be. Mm -hmm. So you travel a lot and have you do any you know, reporting in China? And what kind of stories are your audience most interested in? Yeah, we travel a lot. I'm on a tour of 25 countries over just two months. 25 countries? So I'm going today to Jordan and then I go to America and then I go to India. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, the kinds of stories we're interested in are hard to reach. Mm -hmm. The ones that the mainstream media are not listening to, traditional media are not listening to. Sort of looking at, you know, the, the communities that have been really forgotten. We, ha we teach those communities, refugees, uh, human trafficking survivors, we teach these communities how to tell stories with their mobile phones mm -hmm. and we empower them to be in charge of their narrative. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is we are missing so many big stories because we're not listening to people. So we can use mobile phones to get in touch with people again. Yeah, so mobile phone is what we use mostly. Mojo, it's mobile journalism. Yes, and we are now doing the live streaming through a mobile phone. And, the mojos. and hopefully, you know, in the f new future, and get a pair of glasses like this, and so I, I don't have to use my camera, man, so I use, use the exactly. live streaming myself. Yes. Exactly. Are you live streaming on Facebook now? I live stream on Facebook, but I mean, right now, as you know, in China, it's. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. It's always difficult because you're going to get a <laughs> VPN and blah, 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 blah. But I live stream. A lot. I believe that the future is live streaming always, all the time. Uh, did you ever watch uh, that movie where the guy was live for the entire, I forget what it was called, uh -huh. The Truman Show? This you ever watch The Truman Show? Mm -hmm. I, heard of I think the future is going to be like that. I think it's going to be everybody live all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one more question. I'm short sighted. Can I use this? <laughs> yeah, you would put whatever lenses you want in it. My ones are blank. Uh -huh. There's nothing in here. Uh -huh. I think it'll suit you. You want to try it on? Can I, yeah, yeah. Can I choose this? You look good. You look good. I look good. And then if you press this button, uh huh. Now you're recording us. So how can I know I am recording? Yet you have to, There's you a know. The flashing light on the left. Can you but see it? I cannot see the flashing. I mean, uh, it's connected to a, a mobile app in yeah. your phone, right? So use this. I can see what I'm now what recording. What do you guys think? Does she look good? Uh, yes. She could be a sunglasses model. But, but remind me to take this off when I'm going to, to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf Omar. Thank you. You're most welcome. Yeah. And today you have been attending this uh, forum. This yeah. is two-day forum, and yeah. today we gonna have a case study. Yeah. And I see maybe uh, E will restart soon. So I will let you go, Omar, and you see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. So you're watching live streaming on CGTN, and today is the second day of a global media summit in Hainan province. And just now, some of our guests have delivered uh, speeches and presentations on topics such as the uh, visualization of digital news and some the long form or short form videos and also some uh, new technology on media app. And later, 
Okay, our host is starting the next panel. Let's turn this time to our host inside, Li Chouyuan. Last of our case studies, we'll have two coming up. I know we've had an intense couple of days, so I promise we'll get to the point quickly. But just first, just a bit of history. It was just over two decades ago that we had the advent of digital journalism. Think about that. Just a little over 20 years since the internet shattered journalistic norms rendered the old news cycles meaningless. In my view, the birth of digital journalism, the birth of internet news, was the greatest development in journalism since movable type. Since then, we've had countless innovations, but none have been as fascinating and potentially disruptive as some of the ones that we're starting to hear about this very morning. Artificial intelligence, and cloud computing. Artificial intelligence, known more familiarly as AI, as we've referred to it over the past few days. Cloud technology has freed news organizations from many of the shackles of infrastructure. And AI has offered seemingly miraculous possibilities in gathering, generating, and distributing information. But these advances are not without risk, and they're not without expense. So we have today with us two speakers uh, finishing up the morning uh, who are pioneers and experts in cloud technology and AI. Uh, the first, who I'll introduce now, is Gary Wong, who is the senior product manager of the Baidu Cloud Computing Business Unit. He has many years of experience in developing products that combine cloud commuting and artificial intelligence. He's currently responsible for the intelligent multimedia platform, which combines artificial intelligence, big data, and cloud computing business services for the audio and video industry. Mr. Wong. Dear guests, dear colleagues, good morning. Now I'm going to talk about the ABC strategy of Baidu. Our goal is to use a technology to create better user experience. First of all, now let's take a look at the development history of media. Each new technology, with the advent of each technology, there were new changes in the media industry. Videos are replacing graphics and test. Videos have become a mainstream um, media content format. So there are live broadcast and short videos. So such formats have become important ways for us to convey messages and emotions. Next up, we will see the era of AI. As we all know that the development of AI is, is dependent on the chip's computing power. We can also see that based on this kind of strong computing power, open source and deep learning and other optimized platforms also emerge. All of this combined promoted the development of AI, video and audio recognition, and VR and AI technologies provide more possibilities. In video field, our target is that actually we will further expand the machine sensing capacity. Actually, since 2016, uh, the machine sensing power is already starting to overpass that of human beings. In such a circumstances, Baidu Cloud proposed the ABC strategy 
A represents uh, artificial intelligence, B represents uh, big data, C represents uh, cloud computing. We hope to uh, usher in the cloud computing 2.0. We also hope to empower the media organization, including the content production, marketing, uh, monetization, and uh, traffic traffic uh, improvement. Now let me explain to you how we empower the media industry based on our cloud computing infrastructure as well as our own ecology. We provide all sorts of uh, technological support. We have a Tiangong Tian Zi Tian Xiang Tian Zi four platforms, including 150 cloud computing products. Uh, VCR is a key contact. VCA represents uh, analysis of uh, video content. With uh, artificial intelligence, we can structurize those unstructured information, including the uh, persons, the keywords, as also specific vectors. And for VCR, we review the video content. And we have a multimodal integration for such a review process, including to the detection of uh, pornography, uh, terrorism, content, etc. Now, let me come to the content. There are five types of uh, output. Uh, for instance, uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, technological support after the software packaging. We have uh, this a smart editing system. The users can enter the labels, keywords, or abstracts. Then we can identify the suitable videos for the generation of uh, products or contents. With the VCA standardized information, we can provide the smart technology support to provide a very targeted uh, support. We also can help with uh, the collection of information, for instance, uh, the screen scrap, and also for the categorization. Our structured information can provide very strong support to improve the accuracy and efficiency and the smart review. I think the most common way is the combination between machine review and the human review. The machine review can filter the information and provide a very good basis for following follow-up human review. We also have a self-defined uh, database. For instance, for the recognition of uh, human faces, such as uh, the corrupt officials and also uh, notorious uh, performers, etc. So for marketing, we can provide uh, new types of uh, marketing means. For instance, uh, reinforce the reality. We can make information more interactive, more interesting to retain the users for a longer time. Based on our platform, we can also uh, make use of uh, the marketing time to improve uh, the product exposure and brand exposure. In terms of uh, the monetization, we can provide a second development and we also provide the SaaS level services for the 
scrutinization of uh, advertisements and also for value added services. Here you can see a case of uh, the VCR, the video content review system. For live broadcast or video on demand, we can do such multi dimensional review. Usually, our review is focused on the images, but our services we cover the human face recognition. We also recognize the key words, whether there is any sensitive words, and we also uh, recognize the voice for cross verification. For instance, uh, visa review can cover the detection of uh, pornography and uh, illegal content or terrorism content. Now, let me come to another part. So, uh, we can improve the user's recommendation. We use 4096 vector label and keyword output is the final result. But the 4096 vector is one level above. So this is a more effective approach. Now, for the media convergence, we have uh, the private cloud demand. In this year's business, we have implemented the VCA VCR integrated machine in different applications. This will make the deployment of a private cloud possible. That's all for my part. Thank you. What a remarkable suite of technology available for convergence. Uh, before, uh, as we get the chairs up here, are, do, are there any questions that have occurred to people in the audience as the, as the um, presentation has been happening? Anything here that I see? Not yet. Well, okay, we will start here then. Oh, sorry. So you have a trans translator there. Okay, I got Go. it. So as I say, there were many, uh, there were many, uh, many uses of the technology here. Um, from what you've seen and from the feedback you've had of, from, from users, uh, businesses who have used this technology, uh, what, is the most, what is the most useful use of this technology for a news organization? AI is the most important technology for the youth organizations. We hope that we can minimize uh, the human cost and improve the human efficiency. In some applications, we also have uh, made some comparisons in terms of the categorization. The AI efficiency is uh, about 10 times uh, as high as a human cost, uh, with uh, just a 50% cost. So cost, uh, cost savings. So it's the general trend. What are we looking for? One, uh, one, one, one use that has occurred to me, uh, we had much discussion yesterday about fake news um, and phony news. Uh, I know that in the United States, for example, Facebook has used AI to detect fake news, and fake patterns. Do you think that this is an important use of, um, of, um, of AI for a news organization? Could this be the answer to our problems of uh, having too much fake news? 
For, uh, yesterday, actually, I have heard about uh, such uh, uh, discussions. I want to say two things. Number one, the review. Uh, with uh, AI, uh, we can uh, uh, recognize uh, the fake news. This is something we have done in China as well. Uh, for instance, AI supported review actually can be applicable in the detection of uh, pornography and uh, politically sensitive issues. Of course, uh, we have a higher percentage of uh, human review. We hope to have an increasing percentage of uh, machine-aided review. Uh, in terms of uh, the identification of uh, fake news, machine review plus uh, human review will be the norm for a long time to go. Uh, the machine review will be the first step uh, to uh, provide a very good basis for human review. For fake news, we have also done some experiments in terms of uh, the location of uh, the news as well as the images and source of the news. We actually have uh, made uh, comparisons we have not commercialized our model yet. Oh, okay. So the one is actually using this uh, technology now in, in China to, to detect fake news yet? Uh, uh, not in China. But uh, after listening to the discussions yesterday, I'm also interested in knowing whether this has already been implemented in other countries. So are you satisfied with the progress that, uh, that you're making in, in being able to verify users and, um, and, and, to, and to, to detect uh, phony operations, folk phony news? Should it be faster? As I mentioned, uh, image recognition or review uh, so far the machine sensing capacity can only surpass that of human beings in ideal conditions. So far, I think there is still a long way to go. As we know, uh, we have the driverless car. The biggest challenge is the white screen. If, uh, what, if there is just a white color, there is no special color, and then it will be uh, identified as a failure or invalid. So this is a big challenge uh, to us. When we overcome such uh, difficulties, when we clear away such problems, when we can uh, actually enhance uh, the machine sensing capacity uh, to that of human beings uh, in normal conditions, then uh, by, only by that time we can see the success. So it will be a long time before the machines completely replace the humans then, hopefully. Uh, we are looking forward to the arrival of such a day. <laughs> One issue that comes up with news organizations is, uh, okay, it's wonderful to have this great technology, but does it work with a particular news organization's content management system? Uh, how adaptable is this technology? Um, and, and is the fact that it's in the cloud, uh, does that make it uh, more adaptable to and more easily used by any news organization without major modifications? Uh, our services are based on public cloud. Uh, for the collection of uh, raw materials, an editor, based on spe specific topic, a piece of news or a video uh, will be generated. There's a lot of historical data in the database. And also, this person collected some new materials combined with some historical data and materials, and then uh, 
the uh, passive can generate a piece of news or program, and they can input some keywords in the database, and also uh, they can use some excerpts from some test, and they can do some searching this uh, huge database, and then we can find some relevant uh, materials and content. Uh, and then the machine can automatically generate a finished product based on this. Uh, during this process, right now we still need human intervention and screening. For example, I have screened out 10 uh, pieces of materials and and the human will uh, choose maybe three of them and then uh, they can do uh, further processing by machine after that. Um, questions from the audience? Anyone here? Question over here. Yes, gentleman over here. Please uh, state uh, who you are and who you represent. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Andy Griffey from Marquis Media Partners. I suppose my, my question is not about AI being used to detect fake news, but the extent to which in the future it could be used to make fake news. Mm. Um, if, you, if you Google um, fake news. One of the uh, bit clips of video that comes up is President Obama with his mouth being manipulated to say how much he's looking forward to not being president so that he can play golf much more. Um, okay, it's a bit clunky, but as AI develops and video ma manipulation becomes so much more easy and affordable, um, is there a danger that the technology is going to increase the amount of deliberate fakery uh, that's out there. Actually, it is possible. AI can provide some assistance to us. AI can help us gather information and offers more possibilities. Humans can input information in the AI. If you input wrong keyword, and then AI will work uh, based on the instructions given by the humans. And then fake news can be generated this way. For example, if you are a, you are a gun manufacturer, guns can be used by policemen. It can, they can also be used by uh, criminals. Right, so AI, you know, like a weapon. Uh, can be used uh, for good, can be used for ill. I believe that everyone understands this. Yes. Other questions? Over here. Uh, Hello, I would like to ask you a question. For AI, how can AI replace a journalist to write a, an article with argument and viewpoint instead of just providing some simple data or statistics? Right now, Baidu is working on this, making some attempts. I would like to introduce an application to you. Baidu has about 100, more than 150 cloud computing products. In the early days, Baidu had a small application for writing poetry. You only need to input some keywords or a name, and then based on this uh, keyword, the application can write a piece of poem. Of course. We have accumulated a tremendous amount of data, and, and also we offer a lot of textual training to the AI. But we asked the question you posed. Right now, what we can achieve is that you give me a piece of article, I can generate an abstract, and I can also extract viewpoints from this piece of article. The central gist of this piece of article, and also we can also make judgment or assessment of the emotions, whether it is ne negation or uh, repulsion or uh, appreciation. If you input a keyword, 
was an assert or abstract. Based on that, if you want to generate uh, a piece of article, we need to use a lot of historical uh, data to train AI. In this regard, Baidu has its own advantages because we started as a search engine company. We have accumulated a lot of video, audio, and test materials in our database. We have a lot of data and materials that can be used for training. We have thought about the question you mentioned. How much time is, going, is it going to take? I cannot uh, tell you on behalf of my company. I cannot draw a conclusion about your question yet, about the timing, time frame. So we're not sure yet when we may well have the first Nobel Prize winner uh, for poetry uh, created by artificial intelligence. You know, uh, <laughs> I would like to add some points. It's like this. Just now, I talked about a poetry writing application. For writing an article, it is possible for a robot to write an article. But what a robot does is based on the test humans provide. Within a, a short period, I don't think our robots can surpass humans. But if we give them adequate training, it's just like AlphaGo uh, playing chess. They don't have to refer to the chess handbook or instructions. And the AlphaGo can uh, learn by, uh, by uh, competing with another robot. And then I believe that they can improve and it also provides a direction for us to move forward. As good as the training, only as good as their as their human interaction and the way they've been taught. Basically just like humans. We hope that AI can be utilized by humans, but we also worry about incidents like related to AlphaGo. And AlphaGo, for example, AI has the potential of surpassing humans when utilized properly, and I think they can still do good. Right, and I think one of the, uh, one of the key uses for AI that many of the organizations have thought is writing, for example, simple business earnings stories, uh, thereby freeing up human journalists to do uh, perhaps more in-depth work. Uh, so many, many possibilities here. Other questions from the audience? Right here? Here? Can we have a microphone here? Oh, you have one? Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. You talked about AlphaGo. Uh, in terms of playing chess, AlphaGo can do better than humans. AlphaGo progresses very rapidly. I would like to ask you that why AI cannot write a simple article? Why uh, AI cannot cannot write a better poetry compared with? Human, what's the difference between these two uh, cases? I would like to uh, ask you to elaborate on this topic. For AlphaGo or for chess, AlphaGo in itself is not just playing chess. That's my understanding. Actually, AlphaGo, when doing computing, it's actually uh, making some judgments instead of handling uh, numbers such as 0 and y and 1. But when it comes to articles, well, it is important. It's different because it's, it's kind of subjective. You have to express a central meaning or just for chess. Um, for chess, it's different. And then there's, there's a probability for you to win. But when it comes to writing an article, if there are 1,000 people, there can be 1,000 articles with different gist or different central meaning. For Nobel Prize laureate, 
and I think that the support for judging uh, the literature uh, for this prize, and they all have different understanding. AI currently cannot have a kind of self-being or self-recognition recognition function yet. It's just like writing poetry. AI can write some short articles, but such articles may be uh, it's more like childhood articles. The meaning it can express, whether it can satisfy humans, or whether it can offer some useful information, or whether it can capture the gist. And we still have to do some automation in terms of using AI writing articles. I would also like to talk more about AI in terms of writing articles and poetry versus uh, playing chess. Is it the same thing or will it generate some kind of self-recognition under these different circumstances? Well, for based on my own research, well, I have not uh, actually entered this field yet, so I cannot answer your question adequately. Okay, other questions? We're almost out of time. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, over here. Hello, Supak Son from Lao National Television from Laos. Uh, my question is in regard to uh, the development of AI, for example, and from my understanding that uh, you have to input data and algorithms and many things. Uh, has there been an incident where you are searching for something or you're uh, calculating something, but there is no data? And in, if you are inputting something new, how can you guarantee the data, that data is, uh, uh, I guess you would say, uh, <coughs> relevant or it's not garbage? Uh, in pertaining to your company? AI the The development of AI is dependent on strong computing power. It is also dependent on the advent of the big data. When I was just fresh out of college or when I was still in college, people were still working on facial recognition. Now the facial pattern or model actually, now the new models are based on uh, the patterns generated earlier. Why we have widespread applications of AI, well, it is attributed to data sharing, big data and the internet. You also mentioned um, quality data and poor quality data. Currently we have human screening we also do some machine screening of data. We want to use quality data to to do modern uh, algorithms, and we will also do some optimization. We also need to have some human intervention to make some judgment and to see whether this model has been fully optimized. Of course, some of the data will compromise or impact the structure of the model. We will try to bypass that. We're going to see new advances very soon and continuing advances. I think we're going to have to move on uh, to our next speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wong. And let's move on. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, uh, is Liu Hui, who is Deputy General Manager of Convergent Media Technology Division in China Digital Video. Uh, he leads the development of the cloud-based convergent media platform, as well as planning the design of uh, media cloud products and solutions. He's led the development of many well-known cloud media products that are used in media around China. Uh, he's a veteran of broadcast television industry and has a deep understanding of convergent products and solutions. Please. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, um, 
Liu Hui, uh, from Convergent Technology. I'm very honored to be here to share with you our case regarding the application in media conventions here. I hope uh, my presentation will increase your appetite for lunch. Let me briefly introduce our company. This is the first time for our company to be represented here in such, on such a grand uh, forum. We have uh, been dedicated to the digital video technology and services for 28 years. And our uh, technology and applications uh, have uh, been widely recognized since 2014. We actually uh, have been in a leading position in terms of uh, the provision of uh, solutions to media convergence. And we also hope to continue to enrich our solutions. Now, let me briefly introduce our projects. The first is the UGC platform, first phase project. After this project, we will have a second project, which is the UGC publishing platform, second phase, which can be used globally. The third project is to develop a uh, platform for the exchange of uh, Russian news for the European, Euro, Euro-Asian region. Now let me come to the first project. What's the development of uh, the new media, especially uh, mobile technology? Uh, we have uh, seen the restructuring of uh, the media ecology. And we have uh, seen an increasing number of UGC. This has also facilitated our transformation as an organization. We need to adapt to the emergence of uh, self media in terms of uh, technology. The uh, so traditional systems are quite isolated. They are in rigid silos. In such a context, we have identified our UGC target, that is uh, to generate or uh, to develop a service chain or the platform and also to support the <coughs> professional journalists. We also identified a target of uh, providing co information collection services for the professional media people. And uh, we so I mentioned two targets. One is uh, the UGC support. The other is a uh, professional uh, information processing support. This is uh, what is covered for the first phase of project, including the uh, applications, uh, capacity development, as well as uh, infrastructure. This kind of uh, capacity development can also provide a strong support for the second phase of the project. We can see such a long-term planning for this three-level cloud structure. 
in terms of the functions. This uh, platform uh, will serve the domestic institutions as well as uh, international institutions as well as uh, uh, individual reporters. We also serve uh, the mobile app. We can manage uh, the content, manage the order, and also manage the live uh, broadcast. And these content can be distributed through the uh, internet to different business channels. So this is the module design. Here we can see the out layout of uh, the portal including the uploading of the content, live broadcast management, content management, as well as uh, the financial management. Uh, we can also uh, support the uploading of the content. In this process, there is an automatic uh, screen grab and automatic uh, categorization and also the modulized the transmission of content based on the public uh, cloud technology and the storage uh, space is uh, scalable to allow for flexible distribution we also have uh, the editing tools this is a tool which is uh, free from any plug-in software. This is a green terminal. There is no need to generate uh, video streaming and the original format can be used for editing. So such a function is also include the subtitling as well as a, a special presentation effects and for the first phase of project we also support the broadcasting by the mobile phones with mobile phones uh, we can complete the news collection processing and image processing as well as uh, live broadcast. So this is an excellent tool for professionals as well as the UGC. They can produce news and also to complete the review process. So all of these functions are available on this platform. We manage based on the order. So we can support the pricing, price negotiation, and the settlement. This is for financial management. For individuals, uh, the financial management is also available, uh, including an analysis of uh, the content supplied. So this uh, function has already been put into use. For this uh, project, this is the first time for us uh, to construct a public cloud platform. It covers the media content convergence and also we are oriented towards the global users. For the second project, with the improvement of China's national strength, we need to strengthen our communication with other countries. We also need to convey the Chinese voice to the world. This is the big context for us to launch this second phase project. The purpose is to build up a platform that can satisfy the needs of uh, global users for uplo uploading content, editing, search, and downloading. We also 
prioritize the needs for countries along the Belt and Road route. Yesterday, we honored to be represented for the launching of uh, the Belt and Road News Alliance. So, in this process, we can build on the capacity of the first phase functions. These functions can be carried over to the second phase. In terms of uh, the infrastructure, we also added the private cloud as well as uh, the public cloud. So here we can see the design of the modules. We have uh, the publishing of uh, the user content and also the Belt and Road Exchange Network. Any overseas user can upload their content onto such a platform. Through editing, the content can be distributed to other overseas users. Currently, we focus on the Belt and Road Exchange uh, Network. Uh, later, it will be further expanded to the Latin American region exchange network. For overseas users, they can browse the news and download the content. For us, we can do the content management, including the back office maintenance. Regarding such a global infrastructure, in addition to the public and the private cloud, we have a three storage nodes. In Asia, we have a, and also in Europe and in Af in Africa, in, sorry, in America. So we have a, these are three storage nodes in Asia, Europe, and America. For Asian institutions, they can visit the Asian node, and the European institutions can visit the storage node. So how can we ensure the consistency across uh, the system? We have uh, enabled the automatic distribution of content over the platform. So wherever you access the material, uh, the content is the same. To ensure the consistency, just now, I also mentioned the deployment of uh, public cloud overseas. And we also will adopt a hybrid cloud management system. Another important point is the LISA management. This is a concept for cloud operation. Currently, uh, we provide the Belt and Road content exchange. It has its own portal and its own system for content uploading. When the system expanded to the Latin American countries, and then we can set up a separate subsystem as well uh, with its own portal and uh, the content uploading functions. So this is what we call the multi-LISA management. The News Alliance was launched uh, yesterday. And here you can see some member organizations. We are now starting to carry out relevant work. Between the two projects, we also have uh, built up a Russian news exchange platform. The background and the purpose is to better convey the voice of China and also to communicate Chinese culture to the rest of the world. 
and also to uh, ex have access uh, to the Russian news and feedback into China. We use a three-level cloud architecture for this platform. You can upload content, download content. You can also do editing, and you can also distribute content. So when we were doing this project, we connected the UGC Fast Space platform to this platform. So it means that there will be a new distribution pathway for this new platform. So that is for the Russian channel. We have front-end website facing Euro and Asian countries. So they can browse news and upload content and edit content. They can also remove some content from the website. Every day we can upload some Russian programs and we can also have secondary uh, editing. You can upload or uh, remove content from this platform. Okay, these are some screenshots of this platform. So we pick and choose the programs before we actually distribute them. So these uh, kind of materials and programs are targeted at uh, European and Asian regions, uh, mostly for uh, Russian-speaking audience. So we have started the testing phase. And we are now doing some drill or testing. So for the past years, we have been working together with the media industry. In the past, we focused uh, in a narrow area of media, but now we branch out to other areas with the advent of cloud computing technologies and the internet. And I believe that the media industry will become smarter. The stage is large enough for many players, so there's tremendous prospect and potential for partnership. We have our own technologies and solutions. I believe that this platform will become more diversified and colorful. Thank you. What question that I have, um, the, the, the cloud technology is wonderful for, make, for ease in uploading information. How are you dealing with issues of security? Uh, sorry, my English is poor. Oh, let's, let's, <laughs> let's use the translator then, sorry. Okay, so, so the question was, um, cloud technology makes it very easy to upload information, but there are all, people sometimes have questions about the security of what they upload into the cloud. What steps do you take to make, to make sure that, uh, that, that security is maintained for information that's uploaded to the cloud? Actually, this question, from the perspective of safety and security, in our country, when we talk about se security, there are two layers of meaning. The content s safety, uh, there may be some exclusive content or news that needs to be protected. So when we build the cloud architecture, we will use a kind of mixed cloud. What is a mixed cloud? Based on the exchange need, a public cloud can cover more scope. But for some core or first-hand materials or content, we use private cloud. Well, it depends on the needs and the requirements for safety and security. And then we choose the, the appropriate cloud. And for cyber attacks, or other internet attacks and different methods we have looked into those aspects. So we are not a producer of public cloud 
platform, we will work together with our partners to guarantee that the public cloud will be safe. Our public cloud partner, when faced with internet attacks, they have stronger technology, they have a stronger technical team. So not all clouds are, are, are created equal in this case, which is good. Um, let me ask you what may be an uncomfortable question. Um, what's your biggest worry about using cloud technology? Using cloud computing, the biggest worry or concern, well, not about technical concerns. I am more concerned about user experience. In our industry, in the past, they had different requirements for security and bandwidth when we built the architecture. So actually, the requirements for bandwidth was really high. So, but when we build the architecture for professional professionals and they have higher requirements for bandwidth or bit rate and they also have larger file sizes and under such circumstances the requirements for bandwidth are higher. Now that uh, on the public uh, cloud we are worried that we may not be able to fulfill the requirements of our customers. That is our biggest concern. Yes. Uh, questions from, from the audience? Anyone here? Questions here. Oh, I, I see a question over here. Yeah, hi, uh, Andy Griffey. Um, I'm not aware of any major broadcaster that has put its whole content supply chain right through from acquisition to archiving into the cloud. And when you talk to CTOs, um, some of them say that's because of security concerns, which I agree are going away. But a lot of them say that they're not going to do that because the continuing revenue costs of working with cloud suppliers um, far outweigh the one-off capital costs of buying the infrastructure for themselves of elements of the production process. So I'm wondering whether you believe that that um, imbalance in, in costs is, is eventually going to work in the other direction. Actually, the question you posed, when we are facing our customers, we have multiple customers. They all have their own cost considerations. The cost can uh, include acquisition of hardware or building private cloud. They will consider cost about that. They also consider energy-related costs such as utility cost and green energy cost. These are all their considerations why we are now introducing cloud methods or technologies well, it has something to do with our users. So moving forward, now we have more media formats and they will be converged media in the future. And the users and our user base will expand and also our cloud platform will offer more products and there will be more and more demand for using our back-end resources. So we have to increase our input in hardware and also in energy. So this this will be part of our considerations. Now, with the rapid growth of this industry for public uh, cloud, I believe that the corporate or companies, these, they will face some um, problems that maybe handle what better with a uh, cloud. That is my understanding, although they have their own cost considerations. Other, uh, other questions from the audience? Other questions? Over here. My question is, uh, how can you ensure uh, that there will be no uh, copyright infringement infringements in, uh, in the cloud? Oh. Your question is about copyright infringement about content? Uh, Actually, 
we use a uh, cloud to build our business model and system, and we need to have digital signature, digital watermark, or digital copyright management technologies. So all of these technologies will support this cloud architecture and strengthen the cloud architecture and platform. Right now, we uh, attach greater importance to original content and our copyright based on uh, this. So we are now adopting some digital signature or digital watermark technologies on our cloud platform. So that is how we ensure that we can avoid a copyright infringement. We adopted some uh, technology methods to avoid that. Uh, question, other questions? Do I see another hand? Okay, I think we are, we are rapidly running out of time. Uh, I, th I thought that it was interesting, um, um, in the keynote address yesterday, uh, Mr. Zhang referred to um, the need to find the balance between, and that space between earth and heaven. And that is where clouds are. And so you're, you're doing great work here in terms of finding that spot. So I think cloud technology will help get us to that spot between earth and heaven. Let's hope so anyway. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand the microphone back to our, uh, our host. Thank you, Mr. Wright, and thank you, Lu Xianxiang. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming, and that's going to do it for our session this morning. And for some guests, this concludes their participation at our Global Summit 2017 CGT and Global Media Summit. Um, so thank you again for joining us.